Chapter 11 Tanith did not know what she wanted to do. Her heart had been set on seeking out the powerful, rich, feared dragon, a crimson nightmare whose fame stretched across the seasons. It was her only goal, and yet now she wondered if when the time came, she would turn and run away. His reputation had become less appealing as she met more and more people affected by his violence. Looking down at her paws, Tanith contemplated her own crimson scales that flashed under the summer sun. George, on the other hand, did not hesitate. He sat up straight and looked his friend in the eye. My master is counting on me, he told Tanith. Whether I win or die, I must strive ahead until my quest is ended. However, the compass is not mine to give. It was Captain Tom's gift to you. Nodding, the baby dragon made her choice and slipped the chain off over her head. The compass slid to the ground and the minotaur picked it up, careful not to crush it with his strong hands. Thank you, he said warmly. You see, I am trapped in the labyrinth too. I know all the pathways close to the dragon's cave, but none are the way out. I have never met someone with a compass before. Most adventurers fly in or carry a ball of yarn that will lead them back the way they came. If they run away, they wind it up as they go. If they are eaten by the dragon, the yarn gets chewed on by squirrels and carried away by birds before I can follow it out. Standing on gold horseshoes, the minotaur walked out of the beautiful park and back into the narrow corridors of the maze. I will tell you the tale of this place, he said. There are some mysteries only a gardener still remembers. Did you see a young man on the back of a griffin fly overhead to reach the cave? Tanith asked. I do not recall, the minotaur admitted. I only see what goes on inside the labyrinth. So, the white dog with pharaoh eyes, the red baby dragon, and the black bull-headed man set out into the winding paths together. As they walked, the minotaur talked. There was once a great wizard named George, he said. This wizard spoke to the stars and was the first to learn the prophecy that brought you here. Only a brave soul named George will succeed where others would fail. The wizard George was very powerful. He was sure the stars were telling him about his own destiny. With his magic, he thought he could battle the dragon himself. He set out immediately traveling through the summer lands, the autumn forest, the winter alps, and the spring lakes until he arrived at the dragon's keep. Though many have gone down this path, he was the first. George went right up to Pangborn's doorstep and shouted his intentions. I, the wizard George, have learned of a prophecy. Only a brave soul named George will succeed where others would fail, and I am that brave soul. Unfortunately, the wizard did not realize how big dragons can be. He had only seen them in storybooks. When Pangborn the Red came out to see who was making all that noise, George turned tail and fled. He ran away with magical swiftness and enchanted the ground his feet touched. This labyrinth grew out of his footsteps. Creatures like me were summoned to be part of its mysteries, to preserve it, so the maze would stand between the beast and a wide world of innocent people. Unbeknownst to the wizard, the dragon could fly fast and well. Lord Pangborn hopped right over the elaborate barricade and found the wizard gloating to himself on the beach. He was the first George to be eaten. Now the red dragon flies across the world in search of the rest ensuring his own longevity, preventing the prophecy from coming true. The wizard was the first, George the dog said, and I will not let my master be the last. He is counting on me. He will not join that foolish sorcerer in Pangborn's belly. The minotaur chuckled, amused by the small creature's confidence. <laughs> I take it you were named for your master, he said. Have you hidden him away? Otherwise, you might not have a master to return home to anymore if you somehow succeed in slaying Lord Pangborn. Their conversation stopped abruptly as they turned a corner and the hedge walls fell away. Here the leaves were shriveled up, brown and rotten on slimy branches. The same was true of every bush in sight around the edge of a great hole in the earth. 
The very ground beneath the traveler's feet seemed to fall away into the darkness. Above their heads, the sun was setting, and flocks of swallows flew in chirping masses as they circled the cave and descended into it in vast numbers. Their black feathers made them disappear as soon as they dipped below the lip. Be careful, my friends, the Minotaur said as he stepped back into the labyrinth with compass in hand. Farewell. A rough staircase cut into the crumbling stone wall of the cave was the only way in without tipping over the edge. The traveling companions were without wings, unlike Pangborn, so they began the precarious downward climb by putting one paw in front of the other. Tanith led the way as night fell, lighting the path with the fire in her nostrils. The tropical climate present at the beach and inside the labyrinth was now gone, replaced by damp air that carried a chill, devoid of sun-touched warmth. It was different from the frosty wilderness of the winter country, that had been crisp and revitalizing. This was dank and pervasive. Tanith's inner flame kept her from feeling cold the way creatures like George did, whose paws would freeze in the snow, but she did not like the feeling of being in this cave. Evidently, the birds felt the same way, as the stairs wound ever deeper into the hole, which got wider and wider, there came a place where there were no more bulbous swallow's nests on the walls. There was almost no light aside from Tanith's own, save for the distant twinkling of stars in an ever smaller cave opening and a faint glow from below. The space smelled of smoldering embers and mold. A bit further, the cavern opened out into a vast space that was filled with shapes. Stalactites that should have been beautiful instead looked sickly. Rock formations loomed large and frightening, and dominating the floor was a mound of something that they realized was breathing. George and Tanith arrived at the bottom of the stairs. They were deposited directly in front of the mound. The baby dragon spit a shower of sparks which briefly illuminated what lay before them. Light fell on piles upon piles of diamonds and coins, strings of jewels, boxes spilling precious heirlooms, and decorative weaponry. Intermixed with these treasures were scattered bones, and atop the astounding hill of wealth lay the red dragon of legend. His open eyes glinted before the sparks died out. All at once the beast shifted, sending rivers of jewels past the intruder's feet. Pangborn lifted his head on his serpentine neck until both Dog and Drake had to tip their heads back to see his face, which was now lit by the torch fire slipping out between his lips. He crossed his paws casually. He fluttered his wings into a better position against his back. The dragon was so massive that each of his visitors were the same size as one of his toes. My, my, Pangborn rumbled. The foul stench of his breath washed over them. Have two little snacks come to save me the trouble of catching them? Many years have passed since the last time this happened. George and Tanith glanced at each other. The baby Drake expected her friend to swiftly enact whatever plan he had been concocting, but the mutt did nothing. He looked at her expectantly. Gulping down her fear, the quantity of which bewildered her, Tanith stepped forward. Lord Pangborn the Red, she shouted up at him. My name is Tanith. I am an orphaned Drake, not unlike yourself. I have come to seek your tutelage. Please, take me as your student and teach me your ways. The dragon drummed his talons against a treasure chest until the wood cracked. Though long and sharp, these claws were not clean. They were overgrown, dingy, and stained, just like Pangborn's scales were. His hygiene was so lacking that he looked dark as garnet stone, especially in the half-light provided by fire-breathing. So different from the ruby color of Tanith's hide. I shall consider it, he said, uninterested. And what about you, little dust bunny? The dog stepped forward. Pangborn the Dobbler. He barked loud and clear. My name is Jordy. I have come to ask you a question. Will you end your hunt for men of the prophecy and leave the good Georges of this world alone? At this, the dragon grinned wickedly. He did not notice Tanith's look of surprise. Never, he replied. 
I shall track down every last man named George until they are all gone. I shall never stop. Then no one shall ever name a baby George again. My fortune will then be secure, as will my life. His gaze shifted back to the baby drake. Perhaps you would like to assist me, little one. Pangborn said in a sickly sweet voice, as soft as his cavernous belly could muster. Together, mentor and pupil, we could scour the countries for the single George who still evades me. Help me turn over every last house, claw open every last castle, and tear out every last tree until I find him and eat him. Then we can return here for days of meditation and study, and you can add that pretty unicorn horn to the horde. Do you agree? Tanith stared into Pangborn's golden eyes. They were like a snake's, like Tanith's own, yet they contained a coldness that stabbed the drake's heart. All around her were meaningless possessions sinking into the mud and decay of this deep hole in the ground. Only a few insects and worms lived down here. Even bats avoided this place. When she imagined a powerful dragon's lair, it had been very different, and she did not want to live buried here in this sad cave. I can lead the two of you to the last George, the dog said before Tanith could answer. Will you then leave everyone else alone? Them, their livestock, and their purses? Again, Pangborn smiled unpleasantly. I never shall, he promised. But free of worry, I might sleep a bit longer between hunting trips. Tell me where the last George is, and we will find out together. 